Another very historic aircraft that we have here at the museum is the Lincoln Beachy Little Looper. This is the first airplane to ever achieve a loop in this country, to go upside down. And it was flown by a guy named Lincoln Beachy, who was born in the San Francisco, uh, actually in San Francisco, and uh, flew for the Curtis Flying Club uh, circus for a long time, and then went out on his own and uh, became one of the world's greatest aviators. Uh, he is the one who really invented aerobatics. He was the first one to loop the loop in this country, and the first one to do uh, make recovery from a stall, uh, which is something that all pilots learn today. Uh, he was also uh, uh, spin recovery and uh, just all kinds of tail slides, and he did all kinds of aerobatics. Um, and he did it in the Lincoln Beachy Little Looper, which is right above me. And one of the unique features of the Looper is that it has a rotary engine. So let me show you what As you can see, the engine spins with the propeller, not the propeller spinning around the engine. And uh, there was a lot of different reasons that people thought that they did an engine like this, uh, the rotary engine was spinning it. One was for cooling, uh, one was for uh, getting the oil out, displacing the oil. Uh, but I think the one that I buy in the most to is that in the very early engines on airplanes, they were either on or off. And so that's why if you hear a very old clip of an airplane flying, you hear it and it's coming into land, it's like going, eh, eh, eh. That's because the pilot's turning on and turning off the engine. And so what happens if you turn off an engine with the propeller spinning, it becomes immediate drag and actually slows you down even more than you want it to slow down. But by spinning the whole engine, that acts like a flywheel and keeps the inertia going. And so as you go on and off, it's not as immediate drag as it is just a propeller. So whatever theory it was, we have the rotary engine. Stanley Hiller Jr., the founder of the Hiller Aviation Museum, was actually a helicopter pioneer. Uh, he was one of the big four helicopter uh, creators, uh, pioneers like Sikorsky and Bell and Piasecki. He was one of the big four, Hiller. Um, the remarkable thing about Stanley Hiller was that he was the very first person to ever build and fly a helicopter on the West Coast, and he did it in 1944. And he first flew it over in Berkeley in their, in their football stadium. And the amazing thing is he's 19 years old when he did this. So you think of a 19-year-old kid that could build and fly a helicopter, and he wasn't getting any help from anybody else. Uh, Sikorsky wasn't talking, and you couldn't go on the internet and find out information about it. So he had to design his own helicopter. And that's what he did, and he flew it uh, at, at Berkeley, as I said. And he flew it very successfully, though he had to teach himself how to fly a helicopter because he also was not a helicopter pilot. There weren't any on the West Coast, so he had to not only build this, but then teach himself how to fly it. And, uh, and that's what he did very successfully in Berkeley. Uh, we do have a number of pictures of the helicopter on its side and on its nose, and uh, he had a lot of mishaps with it, but he was always able to reconstruct it and put it back together and fly it. So that is the XH-44 that first flew in Berkeley in 1944. Well, I'm going to do this the Hold your position for a second. Okay. You can talk, I just... Yeah. Hold on, what? This is Korsky had a helicopter earlier. <laughs> the helicopter company wasn't Stanley Hiller's first company. As a matter of fact, when he was 14 years old, he did the Hiller Comet Racing Car Company. And he built these little Comet Racing Cars, as you can see here, that were actually die-cast. They were die-cast metal that he went and got a casting machine. Uh, had one, and he bought one. And then die-cast these uh, little racing cars and put them together and was able to sell them for about $28 a piece in the late 1930s. And he sold thousands and thousands of them at 14 years old. The little Hiller Con racing cars. Another one of his most interesting inventions, and one we probably get the call on the most about people who want to build one themselves, is the Hiller Flying Platform. The Hiller Flying Platform is a ducted fan flying aircraft. And I say aircraft because it's not a hovercraft, it flies out of ground effect, and it's not a rotorcraft, it doesn't, uh, like a helicopter. It is a flying ring wing. And what it does is, if you notice, the shape of the wing, the shape of the, the uh, circle, is in the shape of a wing. And it achieves 40% of its lift by sucking the air over the top of the, uh, the wing. And then 60% of its thrust comes from thrust, pushing the air down. It has two counter-rotating blades in there that help it achieve its lift. So it is the, uh, it's like a magic carpet, if you will, a hiller flying platform. 
I'm standing in front of the Boeing SST. SST stands for Supersonic Transport. This was the competitor in the race with the Concorde. Um, and also the Russians had one. Uh, I'm not sure what its designation was, but we always called it the Concorde. <laughs> but they all pretty much looked alike. They had the pointed nose that could go up and down uh, on landing, and they were supersonic uh, passenger carrying aircraft. What made this one, the Boeing one, so unique was that it was much larger than the Concorde. One of the big problems with the Concorde when it was flying was that it only held about 80 passengers. And so it could never have enough passengers to make it uh, cost effective to fly it. Whereas this particular aircraft could hold over 300 passengers with much bigger and efficient, more efficient engines. Um, this project was canceled 11 months before it was ready to fly. And it was canceled because an environmental lobby was able to get Congress to, um, to go to congressional hearings on this particular aircraft for two reasons. Basically, the first reason was that it would uh, create sonic booms, and of course that would have everybody running for fear in the streets and so forth. And the second was that it would destroy the ozone layer flying supersonic uh, altitudes, you know, supersonic speeds would destroy the ozone layer at those altitudes. Well, okay. This is a model of the SST. We're actually inside the uh, SST right now, the front section of, we have the front 90 foot section. This model represents what the SST would have looked like uh, had it gone into production. And you can see how much bigger it is than the Concorde and how many more seats there were, which would have made it much more efficient and cost effective for people to fly in. So this is our model of the SST. And then as we walk down, you see the inside is unfinished. Uh, and so this is what it looks like on the inside of an airplane. You don't have all the nice uh, fancy things uh, like the lining and the windows and so forth to go with it. And then some pictures uh, as we go down of uh, the SST drawings. And the factory at Boeing, as you can see, that they were actually ready to build SSTs. I mean, they started with the tooling, getting it all geared up and ready to build for the SSTs. And now we're approaching the cockpit. And this is the cockpit of a supersonic transport, which looks an awful lot like the cockpit of a 747 or a uh, 707. And that's because this is 1970s technology. So a lot of people are surprised when they come and say, wow, a supersonic jet. And then they see this, these old uh, instruments in there and uh, think that, well, shouldn't that be a glass cockpit or something more fancy? And so, well, this is what they used in 1970. The Boeing Condor is a 201 foot wingspan completely robotic spy plane and it's made out of carbon fiber composite which makes it stealthy. This particular aircraft could fly up as high as 67,000 feet and stay at airborne for up to two and a half days. It was built as a spy plane uh, for the CIA. It's a very successful program back in 1985 and it tested robotic flight. When I say robotic flight that wasn't remote control. It was robotic. It was programming the computer what to do, where to fly, where to go, and come back and land. Um, what this is, this is the grandfather of the, the Global Hawk, which is what our military uses today. It is a 201 foot wingspan, which makes it six feet longer than a 747, 100 cities, and no pilots. The NASA Swing Wing was an interesting aircraft because the wing actually swing. It actually rotated. Um, it would take off like a conventional aircraft straight across and then it would swing into the position you see it now as it got higher and faster altitude. What this did is it caused less drag and by less drag it got better fuel efficiency. So that is the NASA swing wing that used to fly right out of Moffett for many, many years. And it was designed by Burt Rutan who was the designer of uh, the Voyager, uh, one of the aircraft to fly all the way around the world. Pictures of the Condor flying, you can notice the bow and the wings because the wings were so long, it actually had a nice big bow to it as they flew along. Uh, it had 180 horsepower Continental engines in it, so not very big engines to be flying this big aircraft, but it, it was very light because it was carbon fiber composite, it was very, very light. And we have a piece of the tail that we have on display so people can actually come up and touch it, feel it, and see how light it is, but also how strong it is, very strong material. Uh, and that's what a lot of the aircraft are being built out of today, is this type of composite material. Then we go from the large, large, giant spy plane like the Condor to the very, very tiny spy planes, uh, some of them the size of a, of a coffee mug. 
And these are spy planes, and there I am in the TV, um, that can hover, you know, by remote control just above, uh, you know, 10 or 15 or 100 feet up high, uh, where nobody knows it's up there hovering around, but yet it has the cameras on surveillance. So there are those working on the very big spy planes, and those are working on the very small spy planes. And these are some of those examples of the micro-surveillance aircraft.